Welcome to our Zoom lessons on the writings of the Apostle Paul. My name is Jamie Knapp, and in the next few minutes, we'll be introduced to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to the screen share and to the PowerPoint slides and remind ourselves that Paul wrote 13 letters. Sometimes they're called epistles. Some of the letters were written to individuals. More of them, though, were written to churches. His letters span approximately 15 years. And while the English Bible does not present the letters to us in chronological order, that's our focus. And so in previous lessons, we've looked at 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We've looked at Galatians. We looked at 1st Corinthians. And today we want to look at 2nd Corinthians. And you'll notice that both 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written in the same year, 56 AD, 56 years after the birth of Christ. In Acts chapter 18, we learn that Paul had come to Corinth during his second missionary journey, and he had stayed in Corinth for 18 months, for a year and a half. Now, the Corinthians were a rough crowd. I mean, they lived in a very immoral city, and not surprisingly, they exhibited a lot of those behaviors. But Paul had established a church in Corinth, and he'd made some progress with them, and he continued to work with them to grow their faith individually and to strengthen the, the church collectively. Well, Paul had received a letter and a visit, or perhaps two letters, while he was in Ephesus on his second missionary journey, and he responded to those questions and concerns by writing a letter back to the church at Corinth, the letter that we call 1 Corinthians. Well, unfortunately, his response did not resolve the issues in the Corinthian church. And now it's unclear exactly how word got to Paul, who was still in Ephesus, that things were, were not going well in Corinth. But he, he got the news that there was a crisis in Corinth. And so Paul decided that this was such a critical point in the life of the church in Corinth that rather than writing them a letter, that he was actually going to leave Ephesus and make a trip to Corinth and visit with them face to face. So let me stop the share of the PowerPoints and let's take a look at a map and allow us to get our bearings. And once again, Jerusalem is down here in the right corner. Corinth is over here, and I've already mentioned Ephesus. Paul would have been here. Now, as a part of this lesson, I'm going to mention a couple of other places. I'm going to mention the city of Troas, which is located in this area, and then I'll also mention the region or the province of Macedonia, which is here. So here's Corinth. Paul's over here. Paul decides the situation in Corinth is at a point where I can't just write them a letter. I need to physically go and talk with them face to face. So he leaves Ephesus to come to Corinth. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint slides. Unfortunately, Paul's visit to Corinth didn't resolve the issues. The church was still in a, a crisis mode. So Paul went back to Ephesus. And when he got to Ephesus, he wrote what has been called either a very stern letter or a very severe letter, depending upon which translation you read from. Now, the content, the full content of that stern letter uh, has been lost. Scholars, archaeologists, etc. have not been able to locate it. But Paul makes reference to this stern letter that he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 and in chapter 7 verses 8 through 9. Titus, who was with Paul in Ephesus, is probably the person who carried the letter from Ephesus to Corinth. Paul then left Ephesus, and he and Titus had an agreement that they were going to meet up in Troas, and Titus would, having delivered the letter, would then give Paul a report about how the letter was received in Corinth. Well, Paul moved on to Troas, and he stayed there for a while, but he couldn't find Titus. 
So now he was becoming very concerned, and Paul moved on then to Macedonia. And it was in Macedonia that he did eventually meet up with Titus. We see that in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, verses 12 through 13, as well as chapter 7, verses 5 through 7. Titus tells him that the crisis has passed in Corinth. The church in Corinth is still in existence, and they still care for and about Paul. Well, a very relieved Paul and a very happy Paul receives this news. And then he wrote the letter that we call 2 Corinthians, and he would have written this from Macedonia. So what's in 2 Corinthians? Well, basically, Paul spends a good portion of the letter defending himself and defending his ministry. He also has to, again, address the behavior of the Corinthian Christians. And then he talks again about the collection, the collection that he is taking, and he's wanting to give it to the uh, Christians in Jerusalem. So let's begin with Paul's defense. First of all, Paul had to, had to defend how he wrote. And in chapter 1, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says, you don't have to read between the lines on my letters. My letters are straightforward. They're easy to understand. I communicate quite clearly with you. There had been, uh, there were some who felt that Paul wrote forcefully, but when he was with him in person, he, he was very, very weak. He wrote like a lion and he talked like a lamb. And Paul says, look, I can, I can be forceful with you when I'm, uh, when I'm there with you in a face-to-face -face setting, but I prefer to come with, with a spirit of just trying to build you up. He had to defend how he spoke. Some people said his speeches were you know, pretty worthless, didn't amount to a whole lot. And Paul says in chapter 11, verse 6, I may not be a, a polished speaker, a, a great orator like you're used to hearing in Corinth, but I know my subject matter. I know what I'm talking about, and I know that what I'm talking about is extremely important. He had to defend how he supported himself. He would not accept support from the church in Corinth while he was there ministering with them. His support came from churches in Macedonia. Prior to that, he had even supported himself by making tents. He had been a vocational missionary, and that just didn't seem to sit real well with the, uh, the Corinthian uh, church. He had to defend how he looked. This is the verse where he talks about the thorn in the flesh that he has, that, uh, that the Lord gave him to, to keep him from boasting, and keep him from becoming proud. But apparently, that thorn in the flesh was visible to people and uh, to the Corinthians, it was kind of disturbing, and they didn't really like how Paul looked. Paul had to defend his ministry. He had to, to remind them that he was not inferior to any of these super apostles who, who the Corinthians were talking about or who may have come to Corinth after Paul had been there and told the Corinthians how important they were. Paul says, I have authority from the Lord himself. And I'm not ashamed, not embarrassed, not afraid to use it, but I would rather come to you uh, gently and build you up. So why did Paul have to do this? Why did Paul have to spend so much time defending himself as an individual and defending his ministry? Well, some of the problem was internal. Chapter 2, verse 5, there was a man who was in the Corinthian church who was instigating some of these problems. He was the one that was spreading these, these rumors and, and, and creating this, this dissatisfaction with Paul. But apparently Paul had had a chance to talk to the man and the man had, had changed paths and had asked to be forgiven. And in verses uh, eight through 10 of chapter two, Paul says, I've forgiven him. I want you to forgive this man and let's move on. But there were also external forces. You might remember the Judaizers from the lesson on Galatians. Well, they had come into Corinth after Paul had left, and they had started doing what they did. <clears throat> and Paul refers to them in chapter 2, verse 17, as hucksters, people who preach for profit, people who peddle the word of God. 
And in chapter 10, verse 12, these, these, these people who come in and, and tell you that I didn't share the entire gospel with you, they're really just trying to tell you how important they are. They want the focus to be on them and not on Christ. Well, then Paul had to address their behavior. And it's very important for us to understand that life in Corinth was driven by social status. There was a very strong desire among people in Corinth to be seen with the right people and to move up in society, or at the very least to stay at their same level and not slip back a notch or two. This is one of the reasons why some of the members of the, of the Corinthian church had turned on Paul. Paul was not good looking, apparently. Paul was not a, 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 public, a polished public speaker. He was not an orator like some of the well-known speakers in Corinth were. Paul wouldn't take their financial assistance. And of all things, Paul had been a vocational missionary. He had made uh, or had supported himself by making tents. And that was just not seen as very appropriate in social conscious Corinth. Well, one of the manifestations of this strong desire for social status was an eagerness on the part of the Corinthian people, not just the Corinthian Christians, but just people in Corinth, to attend what we'll call dinner parties. People would host these lavish dinner parties, and they would send out these, these beautiful invitations. And many people, though they had the means to uh, to host a party, they simply didn't have enough space in their home to do it. And so they would rent a, a place that was large enough. And that typically meant that they were going to rent one of the temples of the Greek gods or goddesses, Apollo, Aphrodite, Poseidon, someone like that. And so an invitation would come to attend one of these parties, and the starting date and time would be listed, but an end date and time would not be listed. In other words, it was just going to go as long as it could. And these dinner parties were characterized by three things, gluttony, drunkenness, and all kinds of sexual activity, oftentimes with someone other than your own spouse. And so Paul tells the Christians in Corinth, you got to stop doing this. You, you can't keep going to these dinner parties. You can't yoke yourself or be joined with unbelievers. This is chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Now, some folks have taken these verses and said, well, this is why a Christian should not marry someone who's not a Christian. And that may be a perfectly appropriate application of the verses. But in this context, what Paul is saying is, as a follower of Christ, you can't continue to participate in these types of dinner parties with all that's going on. You've got to set yourself apart. You've got to cleanse yourself, he says in chapter 7, verse 1, and, and be different. Be set apart from the people around you. Now, just in case they felt like Paul was asking too much of them, Paul provides a summary in chapter 11, verses 22 through 28, of, of the sacrifices he has made to be a follower of Christ, including being whipped, being beaten with rods, being shipwrecked, being imprisoned, constantly facing danger and hunger, etc. Well, then Paul focuses on the collection. He had mentioned this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 through 4, and he had encouraged the Corinthian church to participate in this collection. He was going to take money to the believers in Judea at large and Jerusalem more specifically. And apparently, the Corinthian church had agreed to, 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 to participate in that, but they not followed through on their commitment. So Paul encourages them in, in chapter 8, verse 10 of 2 Corinthians, finish what you started a year ago. Follow through with this commitment that you make. And he said, and I want it to be your own choice. I'm not forcing you to do this, but, you know, you said a year ago you would. So let's go ahead and, and, and bring this uh, to fruition. And he said, to be sure everything is ready, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send Titus to Corinth first, and I'm going to send along two other people with him. They're going to travel as a group, but I want you to have your money ready. They, we've been collecting money in Galatia and Macedonia. I want you to have your money ready, and uh, Titus and these two other believers 
are going to collect the money. And, and the reason that they're going to travel in a group is for accounting purposes, so that no one will think that one of them is taking the money and using it inappropriately or just stealing it from the church. Well, before we finish our lesson on 2 Corinthians, let's just briefly summarize. Paul invested a lot of time and a lot of energy with the church at Corinth. We know of four letters that he wrote, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, which we have, but also the letter that he referenced in 1 Corinthians that we don't have a copy of, and the stern letter that he wrote from Ephesus. So Paul wrote four different letters, and he made multiple visits to Corinth working with this church. He also had a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache associated with working with them. They just, uh, they had so much to overcome from the culture in which they were raised and were living. But here's the important thing. Paul didn't give up on them. He kept working with them. He kept growing them individually as believers, and he kept growing the church uh, uh, as a whole. And that's important for us to consider. Well, that's our lesson on 2 Corinthians. I hope you take some time this week to read through the letter. It has 13 chapters. It's not quite as long as 1 Corinthians, but it's still longer than, say, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. So you, you may not be able to read it all in, in one setting. But I encourage you to spend some time with the letter. In our next lesson, we will focus on Romans. I hope you can join us. <music>